Penny Pritzker has served as the 38th U.S. Secretary of Commerce since being sworn in by Vice President Joe Biden on June 26, 2013. Now, as Secretary of Commerce, she is focused on providing American businesses and entrepreneurs with the tools they need to grow and hire. Guided by conversations with more than 1,500 CEOs and business leaders, Secretary Pritzker has developed the Open for Business Agenda. This bold strategic plan and policy blueprint for the Commerce Department focuses on expanding trade and investment, unleashing government data for economic benefit, spurring innovation, protecting the environment, and executing these priorities with operational excellence as careful stewards of taxpayer dollars. Now, before joining the Obama administration, Secretary Pritzker founded and ran five different businesses in the real estate, hospitality, senior living, and financial services industries. She served as CEO of PSP Capital Partners and on the boards of a number of major corporations, such as Hyatt Hotels, LaSalle Bank, and the William Wrigley Jr. Company, and she was executive chairman of TransUnion. Now, additionally, Secretary Pritzker founded and served as advisory board chairman of Skills for America's Future, a national initiative that works directly with employers to develop training mechanisms to prepare workers with in-demand skills. In 2012, she also helped launch Skills for Chicagoland's Future, the first city model of Skills for America's Future. Secretary Pritzker is a longtime member of the Economic Club of Chicago and formerly served as a director of the club. Secretary Pritzker is also past chair of the Chicago Public Educational Fund and a former member of the Chicago Board of Education. Now, in recognition of her commitment to <laughs> education and skills development, Secretary Pritzker received the Harry S. Truman Award in 2014 from the American Association of Community Colleges. Now, while this is Secretary Pritzker's first government position, public service has really been her lifetime, lifelong passion. In 2012, she received the Woodrow Wilson Award for Public Service, an honor given to individuals who have served with distinction in public life and have shown a special commitment to seeking out informed opinions and thoughtful views. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Secretary Penny Pritzker. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for uh, being a, a great promoter of the United States. I love that film. We created that for um, the Hanover Mesa, which is the largest trade fair in the world, where the United States was the partner country about two or three weeks ago. Um, so I hope it uh, tugged at your heartstrings as it did mine. And Eileen, it's great to see you leading the Economic Club. I think the Economic Club we were discussing is about 87 years old, and you're our first woman leader, and congratulations to you. It's also great to see so many good friends here, uh, including former Commerce Secretary Bill Daly and Antonio Gracias, who is one of our presidential ambassadors for global entrepreneurship. I have to tell you, I am really thrilled to be back home. It is such a rare luxury to actually sleep in my own bed. Uh, as all of you know, I love our city. I'm committed to our city. I'm proud to have built businesses and organizations in our city. And yet three years ago, I walked away from Chicago and moved to Washington so I could accept uh, the incredible honor of serving President Obama and his cabinet. I had to, to do that, I had to resign from everything. Every board, every business, our own family foundation. 
It was like going into the witness protection program. <laughs> and on my first day of work at the Department of Commerce, I sat down at a conference room with the 50 people who were my new closest colleagues. They began rattling off acronyms like NTIA, BIS, PTO, ESA, ITA, EDA, plus NOAA and NIST. So less than an hour on the job, I was already drowning in the proverbial Washington alphabet soup. I thought I knew what the Commerce Department did, but I had no real idea of its true depth and breadth. Commerce has 12 different agencies under its umbrella. So we advise the president on economic policy ranging from everything from international trade to the current debate on encryption. We count both fish and people. We issue both patents and weather warnings. And we implement trade agreements and make sense of data. In fact, every day, we at the Department of Commerce collect enough data just about weather, about the economy, and about demographics to fill two libraries of Congress every single day. So three years later, I'm pleased to report that I know what most of the acronyms mean now. I fully understand the true reach of our department and I've come to deeply appreciate the work done by the nearly 47,000 people who are part of the Commerce family. And I've learned a lot, a lot about our government, about our economy, about our businesses, and about our world. So among the many lessons that I've taken away from this job, I want to share three that I think are particularly relevant. First, Globalization and digitalization are changing the economy faster and to a greater degree than I think many of us have absorbed, creating challenges and opportunities for our people, our companies, and our government. Second, our country cannot afford political gridlock. The rest of the world is not standing still waiting for us to get our act together. And third, as business and community leaders, you have much to offer the government. Our country needs you to engage. Government needs the benefits of your insights. As Secretary of Commerce, I've had a front row seat at what Klaus Schwab, who's the head of the World Economic Forum, refers to as the fourth industrial revolution. This revolution is disrupting economies worldwide. It's disrupting the way our supply chains function. It's changing the products in our pockets and in our homes. It's shifting the very nature of work for our people. And it's creating new challenges to our privacy and our security. I saw this disruption firsthand just a couple of weeks ago at the port of Hamburg in Germany, where operations are nearly fully automated. So picture this, massive shipping containers the size of small houses from all over the world flying over your head at incredible speeds. Organized chaos is the phrase that comes to mind. The volume and the pace of goods moving through the terminal as a result of automation is truly incredible. The efficiency at the port created by technology and globalization are a stark reminder of the big questions facing countries all around the world. The automated terminal employs two-thirds fewer workers than a comparably sized non-automated terminal, which is like most of the terminals we have here in the United States. So what risks are created when we shift the way we do business to the digital world? And what does this efficiency mean for people and their jobs? The transition from people to machines is happening all over the world 
and in all sectors of the economy. So we need to have a serious dialogue about the implications of this change on both our privacy and our security, as well as on the average American worker. As ports go digital, as cars go driverless, and as more devices become connected, protecting privacy and ensuring security becomes even more critical and more complex. Today, think about this, a startup in Chicago can win support from investors in London, open a factory in Singapore, and monitor production over cloud servers located in Virginia. Safe, reliable networks are essential to accomplishing that global commerce. Yet more access and more connectivity make us more vulnerable than ever before. So this presents two challenges. First, consumers today are demanding products they can trust to both protect them from cyber risks and respect their privacy. Forcing all of your companies to consider these needs when you create new goods and services. Second, to realize the full economic promise of the fourth industrial revolution, we must ensure that the digital economy supports the free and secure flow of information, ideas, products, and services. This is not just a policy cha challenge for governments. Each of you also has a role to play. You can help us build a secure digital economy by better managing cyber risk within your own organizations and by working with the administration to strengthen the nation's cybersecurity posture. Only together can we ensure the opportunities made possible by today's innovations far outweigh the risks. At the same time, technology and globalization are forcing our country to modernize the way we train people. But we are not thinking bold enough, we are not thinking big enough, and we are not moving quickly enough. I have heard this refrain from people like you, American business leaders, who have told me consistently over the past three years that finding a skilled workforce is one of the biggest challenges facing their firms and their ability to grow and hire. The emphasis placed on this problem is one of the reasons that the Department of Commerce has made business-led, job-driven, and locally determined solutions to closing the skills gap a top priority. It's a priority typically thought of for the Department of Labor or the Department of Education. But we see our role as a convener of the many stakeholders who must be at the table to make progress on workforce training. As well, we emphasize that the solutions need to be driven by leaders like you, who see how the nature of work is changing and can signal what you need from our local workforce to compete. We want to see more communities breaking down silos to determine local business demand and create programs focused on meeting those needs. We're seeing such efforts in communities like Buffalo or Houston or Dalton, Georgia, where business competitors are coming together with local and state government and educators of all levels. And as a result, these communities are ahead of the pack. They are building talent pipelines and insisting that their training ecosystem meet the needs of both their people and their businesses. And with all the challenges facing Illinois, we cannot afford to wait to evolve our workforce efforts. We have to act now. So this brings me to my second point. Our country cannot afford political gridlock because the world is not standing still. I've been fortunate to visit 40 countries in this job 
and some countries multiple times a year. What jumps out at me everywhere we go is that other countries, even nations with stable growing economies, are desperate to be more like the United States with our strong rule of law, our commitment to innovation and entrepreneurship, our tolerance for risk and failure, our ability to adjust and adapt to change, our broad investment in research and development, our world-class universities, and above all, our incredibly talented, productive, and diverse people. Countries want to be like us because we are on the right track. Just look at where the economy is since 2009. Our overall economy is 14.4% larger than it was in 2009. 14 and a half million more people are employed. After-tax incomes are up 14%. And all of the 31 major US banks passed the Federal Reserve's most recent health test last year. Business investment is up 33% to over $2 trillion. And A.T. Kearney just named the United States the best place in the world to invest for the fourth year in a row. We were able to dig ourselves out of the Great Recession because our country's government and business leadership took bold, decisive action to turn our economy around. Now that we're back on a level ground, let's not lose confidence in our approach. There are problems in our country that require urgent solutions, and we cannot afford gridlock. So to maintain our global leadership, we must do something about underinvestment in infrastructure, about our broken immigration system, about our non-competitive business tax structure, about putting more money in the pockets of American workers, and about cracking down on unfair competition from other countries. We need to address these challenges right now because our global leadership is constantly being challenged. So let me focus on one actionable opportunity that the President and the administration have made a priority this year, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. This is our trade agreement with the Asia-Pacific countries. TPP preserves America's continued global leadership and ensures that we, the United States, write the rules of commerce and trade in the fastest growing region in the world not China. It eliminates 18,000 tariffs and strengthens supply chains across the Asia Pacific. It creates customers for businesses like Chicago area Pinch Provisions, a small company that just expanded into a large space in Elk Grove Village to keep up with the demand created in part by exporting. TPP will also make exporting simpler and cheaper for small manufacturers like Gray Mills Corporation, whose products often face arbitrary customs processes in countries around the world or standards that vary from market to market. Fundamentally, TPP requires our trading partners to abide by the same high standards that all of you do forcing them to adopt a minimum wage and meet occupational safety and health standards. It eliminates forced labor and child labor. It even promotes free and open internet by putting in place the most comprehensive set of rules ever negotiated addressing digital trade and e-commerce. Before we unlock the benefits of TPP, we need the agreement signed into law. Though this clear and straightforward economic opportunity is within reach, we are not there yet. The time to act is now. That's why President Obama and our administration are hard at work at making the case for TPP. 
However, the best argument in favor of trade comes from all of you, the business leaders who understand the real value of trade and exports to the companies and workers of Chicago, the Midwest, and the nation. And this brings me to my third point. Our country needs you as business and community leaders to engage. When I took this job, President Obama asked me to serve as a bridge to the business community. Whether the topic was or is free, a free and open internet or travel and tourism, commercial relations with India or advanced manufacturing, privacy or cybersecurity, my team and I have made sure that the voice of business is not just heard within the administration, but that your ideas and concerns are actively incorporated in our policy making. Nowhere is this more evident than our renewed commitment to commercial diplomacy. Commercial diplomacy uses the power of American businesses to influence policy in markets around the world. Early in my tenure as secretary, I went to a large multilateral meeting in Asia where a senior Indonesian official asked me to reach out to Tim Cook about Apple opening and making investments in Jakarta. This was a curious request because the Indonesian government was among the countries trying to implement a data localization policy. Data localization requires the storing of user data with their, uh, on servers physically situated in the country where the data originates. The Indonesian policy was a direct conflict with the goal of generating a new, high-profile investment in Indonesia, given that Apple's commitment to the cloud. Right then, it occurred to us that the voices of US business leaders with long-term capital, world-class products and services, and American values behind them carry immense weight around the globe. We realized that we could make American business leaders great partners in affecting economic policy change around the globe. And we have been deploying that tool ever since. We saw the power of commercial diplomacy in February during a meeting of Southeast Asian leaders at Sunnylands in California. President Obama invited the CEOs of Cisco and IBM and Microsoft to brief the ASEAN leaders on how to create the conditions for innovation to thrive across the Asia Pacific. Imagine this, three CEOs being peppered with questions about what steps are needed to draw greater investment by the Prime Minister of Vietnam, the President of the Philippines, and seven other country leaders. The CEOs made clear that short-sighted policies that restrict the cross-border flow of data will inhibit, not promote their investment. And the heads of state heard the message loud and clear. As leaders, each of you have the power to affect policy. Let me say that again. As business and community leaders, you have the power to affect policy. Just look at what happened in Georgia last month when Governor Deal vetoed the Religious Liberties Bill following pressure from companies like Disney, Time Warner, and Salesforce. You have the ability to not, to not just affect our economy, but to affect the very fabric of our nation. You can own the outcome and you can change the conversation. From my experience, I'm here to tell you that if you're interested in serving in the government, do it. You do not have to be a secretary to make a difference. Become a presidential ambassador for global entrepreneurship like Antonio has. Serve on one of the Commerce Department's 65 business advisory committees. And I promise you, we listen to those recommendations and take implementation very seriously. Or make your voice heard as a commercial diplomat. Travel around the country 
or around the world with your mayor, your governor, your secretary of commerce, your president, to explain the disconnect between policy and practice. Public service can be as rewarding for you as it has been for me. Yes, at times, the bureaucracy and the politics can be frustrating. True, I've never been on a steeper learning curve. But I can honestly say that this has been one of the most meaningful and exciting jobs I could ever have imagined. As leaders with incredible insights into our community and our nation's economy, you have much to offer. Take the chance, seize the opportunity to change our country for the better. I promise you it's worth it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for those remarks. And uh, as a CEO of a global company, it really meant a lot to me and uh, a lot of good advice. Now, as Secretary of Commerce, you've met with over 2,000 business leaders and countless government leaders across the country. So based on all these conversations, do you think we have reason to be optimistic about the U.S. economy? Yes, I do. I mean, I think that, that as, I, as I said uh, uh, during the speech, you know, the U.S. economy is, is doing pretty well, but there's more work that needs to be done, and there's action that needs to be taken, whether it's regarding immigration, infrastructure, um, the, you know, the issues that we're facing in terms of uh, some countries that are not playing by the rules when it comes to trade, and that's a government role. We've got to uh, take those actions. Um, but it requires, you know, it requires action by government and requires pressure from folks like in this room to say we can't tolerate this, it's necessary. We need to also change our uh, business tax structure. It's not competitive, everyone acknowledges mm -hmm. it. And you know, it, it's creating these um, very uncomfortable situations where rules are being changed to try and address it because there isn't congressional action. Okay, thank you. Now, you talked a little bit about the Department of Commerce, but what is the role of the Secretary of Commerce? Is it defined differently by different secretaries? Well, you know, it's a, the role as we've executed it begin, begins with what the President asked me to do, which is to build a bridge with the business community, be the voice of business within the administration, so that means in policy making conversations, and as well as externally, and to be the um, chief commercial advocate for American business around the world. And so those are the president's priorities, and he's the boss. So that's where we begin. Now, obviously, we have a department that has 12 different bureaus and 47,000 people. So the other part of the challenge is to give the department direction uh, and a sense of, uh, of where we're aiming. And that we did by creating a, um, a strategy. We came together the top 50 leaders within the organization and we collectively created what we call our open for business agenda. It's a, it's a business strategy. And we're focused on trade and foreign direct investment. We're focused on innovation, which we define as advanced manufacturing, a skilled workforce, and the digital economy. Uh, we're focused on getting, you know, we produce all this data, but in today's world, it's not machine readable, it's not in a format that's usable by uh, the masses of people who are capable of working with data. So we're trying to, uh, we've put together a really exciting plan there, and it's at the beginning. That's something that's going to need to continue. And then we're full of environmental intelligence. We actually do much of the country's data science, I mean climate science, uh, and at NOAA. We run the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So we have the Weather Service, as well as responsibility for all the fisheries around our coastline. So we literally count the fish in the sea and tell you how many you can catch. Uh, and we weigh the ocean, and we have just opened a water center that's really doing a significant forecasting around 
uh, drought and flooding and things like that. So the point being that you know, environmental intelligence is a big part of what we do as well. And then finally, the fifth uh, priority, uh, as you mentioned, is operational excellence. The goal is to try and do it all better and, and more efficiently and effectively, um, which is, uh, is about culture, and it's also about making smart IT investments and things like that. Now, I know you've visited 40 different countries, and I know you and I have talked about NAFTA and Mexico and the importance do different countries uh, think about the office, the Secretary of Commerce, different than others, or is there a general uh, view on the definition? Commerce has all kinds of definitions around the world, and the role of the U.S. Trade Representative and the, world, uh, the role of the Commerce Secretary around the world sometimes are joined and sometimes are in two separate uh, buckets, which is the way that we are structured. And frankly, I think that um, uh, uh, you know, fundamentally, after three years in this experience, I would actually think about a restructuring of the Department of Commerce. Now, this isn't going to happen in our in my tenure, but I think one of the challenges we face is we go to market, but we don't go to market with certain parts of the organization, um, XM, OPIC, the Small Business Administration. You could imagine those making sense, and the president did propose that kind of reorganization several years ago, and it would make a lot of sense uh, as a go-to-market strategy for the United States of America, which is really what we are. We're, we're, uh, we're a service organization and a sales organization, if you think about our role. Um, but we don't go to market with financing, and so that's a challenge. Uh, so I would, I, I would think about it differently if I were czar, but I'm not czar, and we don't have a, you know, that kind of structure. So you know, we, what, instead what we do is we collaborate, and so we have great relationships with SBA and XM and OPIC, and so we work very collaboratively together. Uh, um, the rest of the world has sometimes puts commerce, industry, trade, together, sometimes they take out travel and tourism. I mean, there are different structures all over the world. Okay. Well, it's interesting, you know, you talked a lot about commercial diplomacy, and in fact, I know the Council on Foreign Relations recognized you as the inaugural Commercial Diplomat of the Year Award last year. So what is, so how do you think about commercial diplomacy, and how did this idea come about? Is it a new idea? Well, the concept of commercial diplomacy, as I tried to explain, is one of really where the U.S. government is side by side with American business working with other governments and often other business leaders. So you have a number of people in this room who've served on different uh, 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 committees. And we go to foreign countries or meet with foreign leaders and uh, we talk about the policies that they have in place that are impediments to further investment. And part of the benefit of having American business sitting there is that the governments want, foreign governments want American business. I haven't been to a country yet that doesn't want more American business, more American products, and they want the values that our, country, our companies bring to the table. Um, but there's often a big disconnect between their own policies and that desire. And so it's, it's effective to travel with American business leaders, small and large businesses. This is not just about our biggest companies, but it's also, frankly, many of the impediments are to our smallest businesses. Well, it's interesting you talk about um, diplomacy. So do you think we're on the brink of a trade war with China? Because that's the one country that uh, we business leaders you know, are a little disappointed in the growth. So is the U.S. in discussion with China regarding steel and excess capacity? And how does the whole foreign exchange play into the notion of excess capacity? So, um, you know, we're constantly in conversation with China. No, we're not on the brink of a trade war. Um, but we're constantly in conversation with China. It's a complex relationship. So in, I think, a week or two, the um, uh, the economic team will go to China to uh, uh, meet. We have two meetings, two big meetings a year, one led by the Treasury Secretary and one led by the Secretary of Commerce with the U.S. Trade Rep. 
Uh, so this is one is led by the Treasury Secretary, but the whole team goes. And we'll work on issues like excess capacity. You know, talking about steel, steel is a pretty um, fascinating uh, subject. And I, wa I want to um, give you all some data so that you can understand what we're up against. Um, China produces about 800 million tons of steel a year, or metric tons of steel a year. They consume about 686 metric tons of steel a year. The rest of it goes around the world. Um, and they, but they have the capacity to produce another 400 metric tons of steel. So they have an enormous capacity beyond what they consume and beyond even what they're producing. To put this in perspective, the United States, and I, there are different numbers for Europe, but both the United States and Europe have gone through enormous uh, uh, restructuring of our steel industry over time. And we produce now today steel very efficiently and very environmental, in an environmental sensitive way for the most part. So we in the United States, so remember China produces about 800 million, 800 million metric tons of steel. We produce 80. We consume 98 million metric tons of steel. So we have a system that expects that we will import some steel. Uh, and so the magnitude of the problem with, on steel is a global problem because there's 700 million ex, uh, extra million metric tons of steel being produced globally. And the rest of the world came together about three weeks ago at the OECD, and, and China was there, but China decided not to participate, and said, you know, we're going to agree on how much, we're going to announce different amounts of production so that we can try and address this challenge. But the big problem is China. And uh, it is, um, it's a, so what are the tools that we have to address this? And this is, uh, first is anti-dumping and countervailing duties, which is, um, the duties or fines that the Department of Commerce puts on someone, a country that's dumping. And it doesn't have to be steel, it could be anything else. We have about 320 cases outstanding that have been adjudicated. Fully over 50% are steel. And um, this year we have the most number of steel cases that we've had since 2000. So this is a huge global problem and a huge problem for the United States. And it's affecting our workers. We've lost about 15,000 jobs in the steel industry so far. So big, big challenge that we're focused on. The other thing we can do is at the WTO, bring cases at the WTO, which that's the US trade rep does that and we work to support him there. Um, and then the third is multilateral conversations and, and dialogues, which are negotiations uh, around this issue, which is like the OECD meeting or the, the meet, bilateral meetings that we have like directly between the United States and China. So we've been working with China on this. They've, they've said that they'll address 150 million metric tons of steel over the next five years and bring down their production, but that's insufficient to deal with the problem. So that's the scoping of the challenge that we're facing. Uh, you saw yesterday the president raised this subject. The president is talking about this, and this will probably be a G7, G20 discussion. But I can tell you, being in the food business, we're in the middle of buying a small Chinese company to support another Chinese operation. So we're, you know, we believe that there'll be opportunities there in terms of uh, trade and growing the relationship. So that's good to hear. Now, um, what can U.S. businesses be doing to help their employees understand the importance of lifting tariffs and improving uh, trade agreements around the world from both an economics and safety standpoint? I, I think that sometimes our employees don't understand that. I think that, uh, and we're working with uh, uh, a significant number of companies, but frankly, all of you, I would hope, would do this. I think, first of all, you have a, a responsibility to explain to your employees the importance of the foreign business that you do and how it's not just about that marginal 20% or 30% of your business and in some instances 50%. It's a, it's, it, it allows the company to exist as it does, right? That's first. And the second thing is to explain we're at a disadvantage. In the Asia Pacific region, 
There are, since 2000, there have been 100 free trade agreements. China is in the process of trying to negotiate its own multilateral free trade agreement in the Asia Pacific. And either we're going to set the rules or they're going to set the rules. And the benefit of the rules that have been negotiated in TPP is, as I said, it raises labor standards, so it makes our, our workforce more competitive. It lowers 18,000 tariffs, so it makes your goods and services more competitive. It addresses things like customs and uh, uh, issues that are particularly faced by uh, arbitrary rules that are particularly faced by small businesses. It addresses digital questions for the very first time and um, much of the dispute resolution occurs within the context of the agreement. So it's got a lot of value to the United States. And I think that what's happened is, in many dialogues, globalization and digitalization is being conflated with trade. And we're going through this massive change, but that doesn't mean we don't need trade because 95% of customers and consumers and the market is outside the United States, and they want our goods, our services, and our products that are made here in the United States. Okay, well, I have an employee meeting Monday. I'm gonna use that. With Good. You. Good. Now, prior, prior to becoming Commerce Secretary, you were a business leader for 27 years and managed an incredible array of businesses throughout your career. So, and I'm sure you were involved in entrepreneurship. What do you love about entrepreneurship in business um, around the world? I love building businesses. I always have. It's what I knew I wanted to do since I was a little girl. And um, you might ask, why am I doing this job right now? But uh, it's, um, uh, it's fantastic to have an idea to build a business, to create a market, to work with uh, people uh, closely to try and create something and satisfy a need, that's a very, that's a wonderful thing to do and I, I love it. And so it's great, you know, in this job I get to advocate for all of you who are doing that right now. So do you look at that in your future? Well, uh, we'll talk to me January 21st, okay. we'll okay. discuss okay. that. <laughs> now, why has the Commerce Department placed such an emphasis on data? I know you talked about big data and we were talking about Hamburg earlier where I have an operation and you were just there. So what is it about um, data that you think we can add value to? Well, if you think about, um, you know, we live in an era of big data and I'm certain that your company is now taking all the information about uh, your various products and trying to better understand opportunities uh, from that. That's going on in every single business here in this room. Uh, the United States government shouldn't be any different. We, and frankly, the data we produce is your product. It's a taxpayer funded. Um, we have to do some of it by virtue of the uh, Constitution, like the census. The Weather Service, you know, uh, uh, obviously an incredibly important public good uh, is of all the sensors, buoys, satellites, and uh, uh, mechanisms that are necessary to produce the weather. But the patent and trademark data is very useful so that you, if you're inventing something new, you can look and better understand what is prior art, what is patentable, what's already been covered. That's been very difficult, and I'm just giving you a few examples. We also do GDP and a bunch of the economic data that we produce. You know, that could be used for making better business decisions. But today, we're, and we made some progress, but I consider it like a startup. It's something that needs to be nurtured going forward, to, which is to make uh, more of our data more easily usable and so that there's either, um, so that you can make better decisions about uh, where to sell your goods and services, where to set up new facilities, uh, and perhaps have new insights about demographics so that you develop different products. All of that is a potential opportunity for the American economy. Our job is to help you know, create the conditions and help facilitate your ability to grow. Good, okay, well that's important. Now, um, I was very intrigued by your recent trip to Cuba with the president. You know, was that a highlight? Uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, it was historic. It was really exciting to go. It was my second trip to Cuba. We at the Department of Commerce are um, responsible for probably 50 or 60 percent of the regulations as, that are implement um, uh, uh, the uh, embargo. 
uh, and so, or implementing Helms-Burton. So as a result of the president opening relations with Cuba, obviously we still have an embargo in place, but we're able to adjust our regulations to facilitate certain activities uh, that are allowed under the embargo. And so, you know, today we, you can make a direct telephone call, you can take a direct flight, you can, uh, uh, soon you're gonna be able to stay at a Starwood Hotel, uh, American tractors are going to be made in Cuba. Uh, greater telecommunications equipment are going to be available. There's going to be more internet. I mean, when you're down there today, it's very difficult to use the internet at all. Um, the president was very welcomed in Cuba. The streets were lined everywhere we went, which was very exciting. Uh, and probably one of the highlight of the trip for me was um, uh, the press conference that the president uh, Obama and President Castro did. It was the very first time President Castro had done a press conference with foreign press. And, uh, and it was a, a study in um, contrast to watch our President and President Castro uh, kind of manage uh, the public message. But it was, it, was really, it was really fascinating. I mean, Cuba is not gonna change overnight. It is a socialist country. Its leadership has em embraced the idea of, uh, of uh, normalized relations with the United States, but I don't think it's ready to accept the massive change that could come, on, I mean, if, if almost overnight. And so they're slowly making change, but they are evolving. And I think it's, uh, I think one of the great benefits though of, 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 that I've seen over the last 18 months is the Cuban American population has really changed its attitude about our relations with Cuba. Uh, there seems to be much more, uh, folks are much more excited and welcome the idea that we have normalized relations than has been historic policy, particularly in states like Florida. So do you think you'll be back again soon? To Cuba? Uh, probably as a private citizen, I, I don't think I'll be going uh, on. Our, our department is doing a lot of work with the Cuban government, but I don't think I'll be uh, traveling there again okay. as secretary. Now, how would you characterize, um, thinking about the future, your department's le legacy under your tenure? What do you want to get done in the next X period of time? Well, I mean, you know, obviously we've worked on a lot of different things, um, and, uh, and I would say that uh, when I think about the things that we're trying to uh, sort of shift in the Department of Commerce, it's to really continue to have the Commerce Department be a Commerce Department of the United States in the 21st century. So what does that mean? Um, it really means doing things like embracing the digital economy, developing really deep relationships with the innovation, uh, with innovators and uh, the, the um, really innovation that's going on across our country. Um, it's it's uh, driving advanced manufacturing. So we have created, uh, the President and, and uh, the Department of Commerce manages the network of advanced manufacturing institutes. You have one here in Chicago for digital manufacturing, but today there are nine, and I think by the time uh, the President's out of office, the goal is to have 15 uh, advanced manufacturing institutes that take uh, uh, cutting edge technology from lab to market over the next five to seven years. Another thing that we, I think, is, is a big change is what you saw the film, Select USA, is for the very first time the United States of America is embracing foreign direct investment and we actually are actively uh, marketing the United States in 32 countries around the world and we created an organization to do that. Uh, that did not exist when I came in um, and that's been a, a big, uh, a big effort, and I'm uh, and and I'm very proud. We've I think have facilitated about 19 billion dollars worth of investment so far. Um, and another thing that we've done is created a digital economy leadership team, which is really a policy uh, expertise on the digital economy to help advise the president on um, any number of issues. You know, everything from privacy and security and encryption. 
to all the various issues that arise as a result of the growing digital economy. Uh, we've also created, with data, to try and get more of our data out, the, chief, uh, the Commerce Data Service, uh, which is an internal group of programmers and uh, data scientists and data analysts and programmers to create uh, uh, products, uh, cutting-edge software products and uh, web services that can be used not only by the department for better decisioning, but also be used by the public. Uh, and finally, commercial diplomacy. I think that's another legacy uh, that we've created, this real notion of partnership between American business and the U.S. government as it relates to changing policy, economic policy and commercial policy around the world. Great. Okay, so here's my final question. Um, and I love that you're a Chicagoan and we have all these wonderful Chicago people and our kids here. So what's your role at Commerce taught you that we could use here in Chicago to build our commercial strength and hopefully overcome our fiscal problems. So what's your advice to us? Um, it takes collaboration between government and the private sector. And, and if there's one thing I've learned is that the best insights and some of the best guidance that we've gotten from policy has come from business leaders like all of you in this room who have said, here's what needs to happen. And uh, so I would say, uh, you know, by building a bridge with the business community and working closely, which is something we've done you know, since I've lived in Chicago. This has been part of our fabric. Uh, we just need to do more of it, and we need to not to lose, face, lose faith in not just Chicago, but lose faith in the direction that we're taking our country. Well, on behalf of the Economic Club of Chicago, thank you, Secretary Pritzker. We appreciate that you were able to be with us today. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.